Hello, and welcome to The Confident Commit, the podcast for anyone who wants to join the conversation on how to deliver software better and faster. If you're looking to build a toasted ship, tune in less confidently commit. I'm your host, Rob Zuber, CTO of Circle CI, the industry leader for all things CI and CD. And today, I'm joined by Patrick Dubois, industry luminary, and uh, I came up with DevOpser since the very beginning. Um, Patrick, thank you so much for joining me today. I am so excited to uh, to chat with you. Well, my pleasure to be here. And, you know, it's the first hour time somebody called me a dev officer but it's the first thing <laughs> well, for everything <laughs> as, as discussed before we started i made up that word and google docs refused to use it and replaced it with something else but i, I put it back uh yeah i mean from the from the very get-go right uh this has been a, a long journey uh that we're, we've gotten on i would say from a devops perspective and will be on hopefully for a long time to come um and you know your your voice has been out there again right from the very beginning um in terms of writing, speaking, naming things, you know, whatever it might be. And so I'd love to kick off with just a little bit of that. But, you know, we both discussed that we're much more excited to talk about where everything is going now with recent changes, et cetera. But, um, you know, I think in in 2022, you gave a talk uh, that was sort of a, a, a retrospective of year by year, you know, what the themes were in DevOps. And I'm curious if there's something that's like a fundamental, interesting change compared to what you thought, you know, you were getting into at the beginning of all this, um, based on, on what you've learned over all those years so far, um, that really kind of points out where we're at. Sure. Um, I would distinguish probably two things in that there's my personal journey where I learn things. And then there's the industry thinking about what, what it's supposed to be. They're not always aligned, but you know, that's fine. Uh, I think, you know, coming back early 2008, it was indeed about, you know, two big groups, the developers and the operations being separate and kind of very centralized, one group, very centralized, another group. Mm -hmm. I think if you're talking shifts over, you know, now, what is it, like 15 years or something, centralized, decentralized. That's clear. That has happened in many companies and it has happened on the organizational wide. You build it, you run it. It has happened on the microservices, like not monolithic, but decentralized microservices. So those things kind of have, have changed um, in that perspective. Mm. So the initial collaboration things of, you know, let's sit together as two groups who do things, uh, they did shift a little bit due to the decentralization. How do you s sit together with all the other groups? You know, there's now more groups than just developers and the ops to talk to. You know, there's the microservice who does authentication. There's the one that does the logging. There's the one that does the billing. So mm. we, we shifted into uh, an even more complex conversation model, kind of, you know, making up for the organizational shift and the independence we had to make up for with more conversations. This also shifted technical things like, you know, how do we test? Do you test the monolith? No, no, hang on. Like, th this works differently. End-to-end <laughs> -end testing, it's hard uh, uh, coordinating those things as well. So those are like shifts that have happened. And then what I'm now seeing is that we went from centralized to decentralized, and now we're settling on a hybrid version. Mm -hmm. with a platform team somewhere making up between where it's not good to have the central decentralization, but making up a little bit back again to the centralization. And you see this in other topics like um, imagine one of the feature teams stops, you know, is being un, uh, abandoned or something. Who takes care of that code? In the beginning, there's always like, okay, where do we toss that ball of going in? And who takes about the governance? So that centralized governance and enablement function shifted mm -hmm. probably to the platform team. So that's another change that has happened. Enablement and all these things have been done in the past by ops teams, or at least, you know, the good ones that were enabling other teams to do faster delivery. But kind of that is another organizational shift that has happened in the industry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe on a, to finish that thought on the more personal note, I learned that yes, we are shifting around complexity and we're making up with communication and technologies choices to move from one model to the other. 
But the friction I was thinking about DevOps on my personal journey, and that was part of my talk that I did, I learned that even though we're thinking about the pressure between DevOps building up, or now between team one and team two or three building up, there is other tensions like if you don't hire the right people and your HR is not working, that has an impact on your engineering topic. If your engineering topic is not delivering the right features from product, we don't get money, we can't hire, we're doing a bad job. So I, I personally started to seeing the friction that we were dealing with in a broader perspective, more in a business context. And again, HR from billing to finance to you know your pre-product to your, your developer relationships. And the, the dependency on getting it right was broader than probably I phantomed in the beginning. Some people will not call this DevOps, some will call this DevSecOps, HR, and they keep on adding things. But it is interesting to see, and that has been my personal learning about expanding this friction between silos to different parts of the organization who are not engineering, but do affect how engineering works as well. So those are kind of my two directions there. Yeah, that's that's really fascinating, that last bit, um, because I think I have gone on a similar journey differently, which is mostly about you know, being part of a growing organization over the last nine and a half years that I've been at Circle CI. And so my role within the organization, despite having the same title for most of it, has shifted significantly, right? From kind of lead developer to never developing, right? And focused on, you know, leading an organization, all the things you mentioned, HR, finance, like how the whole organization works and the impact and interrelationship between that and how we can effectively deliver software. And so I think you know, part of that is the industry gaining recognition. And part of that is is folks just growing in their own roles, right? Like you get more time, more experience, you learn the real interplay of all these different, um, different parts of the organization. And so it would be interesting. I mean, I can't project myself back, but it would be interesting to know kind of as a, as a younger developer, you know, are folks seeing that more than maybe we did 15 years ago, or is that the sort of the journey of personal growth for everyone in their, in their career? Yeah. Um, awesome. Well, so now, I mean, let's, let's jump right into the last year has been speaking of personal growth. It's been a, a massive shift and growth for, I think everyone in terms of how we think about, um, software delivery, of course, referring to the introduction of, uh, a gen AI, or at least the mass adoption and, and awareness of generative AI, um, and the impact that it's having as everyone, I mean, we just named every department, well, probably not every department, but, <laughs> you know, across the span of organizations, many, many different people are looking at, you know, how can I use this? How will it impact my work, et cetera? But in order to get there, many teams now are building applications that are leveraging generative AI, right? Or, or something like it, like, how can I add more interesting capabilities into my product to support my end users. And I think this is a place that you've been spending a lot of time. It's like that shifts the way that we think about building software, right? It used to be very one plus one is two, very deterministic. I wrote a function, the function always does the same thing. And now it's, you know, I have a tool that produces something, a summary or some content or whatever that might be. And I want to know if it's good. And I want to think about delivering it effectively and being confident in it. But the question of what is good, um, is really changing. And so I'm curious, you know, what you've seen in terms of uh, working with that to date. And then as you think about everything that you've learned over that last 15 years, how do we take the good parts of that and everything that we've, you know, that we've learned and apply it in this space that's changing so quickly now? Yeah, it's, um, I see it as um, using the same principles, but probably the techniques will have to be different. Like you say, it's non-deterministic and how do we deal with this? But we still want to have confidence, testing, observability, all those things in there. So what I've learned in, you know, in our journey doing this over now a little bit more than a year uh, is you all start off like, okay, you know, let's make it function and everybody's happy. I, I call this like, you know, the developer phase, you we're, we're kind of like getting mm -hmm. through. Um, and then we're happy that it is in production, but then 
we we actually are manually babysitting things again as we used to do with you know our whatever war file that we threw over the wall and looking at these things uh but but now i see um the next phase kicking and it's like okay how do we do testing of this and what what you learn is that um it is not deterministic, but your test case is more important than ever. You just look mm -hmm. at it from an input and output perspective. You don't need to know what's in the box or how it works. So it's a little bit more to end-to-end -to -end testing. You look at your use case and you say, you know, if I want a transcription, it should be X amount of lines. That's a little bit exact, but it should be relevant. And then maybe you use a model that is specifically on checking relevance. Um, or if you want to go the extra mile, you use an LLM to verify what the other LLM did. And so you start creating these test cases for your use case, and then you run them over and over again. A new model comes in, you can check this, and you get a better test set. Uh, you change something of your code, your logic, you can test it again. But if you don't have that test set, you'll be running again like we used to do. You know, you're running around manually. Looks good to me, right? It's like, let's deploy. So why is that same test set so important is that we are now starting to see the use of this in observability. So we're instead of running a health check of just an API, it's alive, it's not alive, it's functioning. What we're basically going to do is run that same input output test set in production. Mm -hmm. Because imagine you're using open API as a service they're changing something you wouldn't notice, mm. but you would have to see this. So the kind of health checks that you're running are reusable across. What is really weird for engineers is that it's, um, it's not deterministic. It's, it's not like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm changing the lot of JIC, but I know exactly what's going to happen, which one of my tests are, are going to fail, but you need to have that, um, layer of testing to know whether something will change. And then you move more into like a unit test style back, like, okay, in this case, it was bad. For this, we need to capture also what people are doing with this. So the feedback channel that we've been advocating from, you know, whether that was in customer metrics or usage or how do they do this, we actually are now more and more relying on the humans to give us feedback, whether they mm -hmm. like the answer, yes or no. That could be a simple thumbs up, thumbs down. Yes, it tells you something, but you can go further. Uh, let's say if you have a copy and paste button, if somebody pastes this in, <laughs> then you get a signal like, okay, probably they liked it. And then when you make an edit, box where they can edit the answer that was generated for for Gen AI, then you can see how much they edited. So you have a quality metric. So you start capturing those as well as quality metrics for your use case. You can't just say it's a quality metric for your LLM or just for your code. It is about the whole chain that you put together. Mm -hmm. And that's the shift that I've seen companies do in getting better at the uh, predictability uh, of the delivery. Well, I think that that notion of a quality metric for a use case is actually one that we should be pushing into all of our software perspectives. Like sure. for, for me, this is kind of the underpinning of an SLO is I'm measuring customer impact, right? What, regardless of which golden signal or whatever, it's like, is the customer experiencing the what they expect to experience from us? And if we're failing them, then let's know about that and do something about that, right? And so I think, you know, as you talk about the quality metrics, which are really interesting, right? Like observability of effectively, how is the customer behaving in response to what we've given them is a much better signal, even outside of generative AI, it's a much better signal than did we respond in a hundred milliseconds, yep. right? Like a hundred milliseconds could be more than great. It could be terrible depending on the use case, right? And so really seeing how do my customers respond and because Gen AI feels tricky, I think it's forcing us in sort of the ways you describe, like, did they press the copy button because they actually like this and they want it in their, you know, in their paste buffer or whatever, yep. uh, or did they type another query because they obviously didn't get what they wanted on the first one, right? And like, we can read from that whether our, our software is working effectively. And I think that's a, that's a really great discipline actually as a side effect that yeah. will grow out of this pursuit. And you could 
say this is actually two silos typically in the company, which one is the business analytics mm -hmm. <laughs> and the technical analytics from, you know, your monitoring system, but mm -hmm. kind of combine them because you cannot predict all the use cases of people generating stuff. <laughs> you yeah. can only do this in prod. And, and that feels weird, That, but you can capture those and then add them to your test data. So that's why capturing the feedback of the end user also helps getting a better test case uh, in there. Anyway, that, that's, I think, is where the evolution is now shifting towards uh, there as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's that whole notion of um, just business metrics as a technical metric we should be doing more with again like if you know I, I've always used the example of login suddenly drop like we probably broke something on the login page right it's not like the world just decided they didn't want to log in today like we changed something <laughs> right and yes like the three people who managed to use it the response time was still great but something's broken and we should be paying attention to that. And it's user behavior is often a better indicator than just raw numbers. Um, and so again, I think it's a discipline that I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing us develop. I think it's very um, early, I guess I would say. So are you seeing, um, are you seeing people do this really well? Are you seeing sort of toolkits that really enable this? Like what, what's kind of the state of affairs as you're seeing it right now? Yeah, so there, there's, you know, in this space, there's quite some tooling popping up, um, whether that's iterating um, on your prompts, for example, um, that, that's almost like A-B testing a prompt, mm -hmm. and you capture all that feedback, was it good, was it bad? So that's one way. Um, the monitoring systems, uh, there's, there's those that just extend their monitoring system with technical metrics, like the pricing, response time, token, for a time to first token. But there's the other ones who come maybe from more from the data side that do data quality. Uh, so a company like Y Labs or something is kind of doing those things. And, um, yeah, everybody's kind of came through the year with a build it ourselves. <laughs> And now you see the tooling just, you know, popping up. And then it's a matter of like, you know, who's going to win this race? Like, is it going to be vendor A or B? But we need the system to find the feedback. Um, but I definitely see this increase. And while people got excited and, you know, they struggled with getting the first run going, the actual challenge is now getting this under control and getting this robust. Uh, and not only from that quality perspective, also from a security perspective, uh, are we not? Um, so that's another, uh, part that is growing. Um, for example, you see, we'll see more and more, um, I call it like WAF like capabilities, mm -hmm. but on the LLM that start mm -hmm. filtering things out that shouldn't go in, shouldn't go out. Um, and that's just going to be a service. It's not just go uh, the guardrails are not going to be implemented in each of the apps that's going to move into a global service. Uh, <clears throat> much like the monitoring and stuff like that. So there's definitely uh, you know a lot of movement in the in the product space there uh, from companies. It it's such an interesting cycle because I I think you're right like none of these tools exist so everyone starts using gen they're oh I'm going to bake gen AI into my product to do this or to do that or whatever and I'm just going to build all this stuff myself. And then at some point somebody says, "Oh, well this is a common pattern. I'm going to go solve that." problem for everyone. But I, I think the people that identify the patterns are typically people who are doing the hard work, right? Like they're trying to build a thing and they say, wow, this is really hard. I bet other people have this problem and then pivot away from whatever that is. So we, yeah. we almost have to wait for someone to fail at building what they're building. So they'll say, oh, but you know what we could do is build the tooling for this uh, and and solve everyone else's problem. Because if you just look at it from the outside, you're probably... I mean, people might get it, but you're often wrong about what the real hard problems are until you're like trying to do it yourself, you know? And so yeah. I, I, this is like a desperate cry for someone out there to try, even though they're not interested, just so they can find the right tools to go build because we'll need those, right? And, and then I think there's another interesting challenge for folks, which is when tools are this early, right? I mean, the sort of evals is one example yep. or you know the metrics measuring uh, like it, like um observability it's hard to make a really deep bet 
because there's going to be so much churn and so many people are going to try new things. And then we'll eventually say, oh, I think this is the one, right? Yeah. Um, and so I think there's a an interesting challenge to implement tools in a sort of abstracted way, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to use this one for now, but I'm pretty sure something else is going to come along and something else is going to, it's like, all, it's, it's, I just think it's hard to make a big bet right now. Again, because so many things are. Yeah, and the abstractions changing. have not been settled in a way. So this has happened already many times, right? Oh, mobile. Okay, we, you know, everybody was doing their cells, and then we got a few of the standards. Cloud, you know, then more and more we got like, okay, the protocol of S3 is kind of getting a standard or something or the deployment. Um, it, it, I call this like an innovation tax. Like mm -hmm. while you're innovating, you're being taxed because what you do is instantly legacy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. But you want to be first and you want to have that competitive edge, but it's going to cost you not just of running, but like refactoring this until the dust settled, uh, as you say. Uh, but there's not much you can do about this uh, besides, you know, kind of gambling, not really gambling. Mm -hmm. There's hunches like one will be looks more robust than the other. One will be, you know, backed by this group. So you kind of estimate, but that's, that has been with every new kind of tool that like, or new kind of um, part that has been introduced uh, in there. Um, yeah, I, I think that's totally true. And so I'm, I, I don't have great answers, but I do believe there's some good <laughs> design approaches that come from acknowledging this is like, like a hedge, like, don't try to build the perfect abstraction. Just ensure that the cost of change is low, yeah. right? Even if it's, we'll just throw that thing out and build a new one because we built it so cheaply, right? Don't super invest in the bet you're making because your bet's probably wrong kind of thing. Yeah. Like I think about the last time I saw this kind of consolidation after a period, the one that comes to mind is Kubernetes, right? Like 2016, mm -hmm. there were 10 <clears throat> orchestration engines. And by the end of 2017, there was one, yeah. which means you know, 90% of people, if it was truly distributed, had to go rewrite their implementation in some way, right? They said, oh, well, that's dead. Now I have to go do this other thing. And so you could have been all in or you could have been a little bit abstracted. And I think it's another one of these cases where we're going to see a lot of, you know, interesting capabilities come up and then we're going to say, oh, actually, no, I like this model better. So just, you know, build in a way that recognizes yeah. that there's going to be a lot of fluidity I guess. Is and that's why that testing going. becomes so important again. Like whenever you swap yeah. something in and out, you, you at least have your use cases and you have your, you know, what you expect and what you think is good and bad uh, that you can use while you're refactoring to another service. And I right. sometimes say like you have continuous integration, continuous delivery. And for me, what comes after is continuous re-architecturing. And that's for that phase, what, what is basically happening yeah. or uh, we're swapping in uh, a model because, you know, Today, there was a new model. <laughs> we just need to have this to be competitive. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, I think that's a really great point is like thinking about where where your tests exist, right? To your point of use case, depending on which part you're thinking about swapping, like knowing that you could replace that piece and still know that you're getting good results mm -hmm. um, is, is really critical. And maybe being super invested in the low level unit testing of a thing that you might rip out Maybe that's not the most the most yeah. valuable thing. So I mean, engineering is all trade offs, right? <laughs> Figure out what the cost is and what the risk is, and and make decisions appropriately. So we talked a little bit about um, you know 2023 it was big shift, right? I mean, end of 22, but really 2023 was like a very big shift. You know, as we're heading into 2024, um, what do you, what do you think is going to happen this year? Is this the year of like application of all this? technology and the tech is more slowly evolving or are we going to see some some more interesting you know fundamental shifts this year oh, i don't i think the technical explosion has not finished <laughs> to be honest mm -hmm. um so yes we we got a few patterns like uh, rag and something and you know they're the improvements lessen right uh, so you know we're getting it under control we still have things to learn with feeding in knowledge graphs, which is another way. So that's still going to go on. Mm. But what is probably, you know, where the industry is looking for, whether we achieve it, yes or no, is that we move also towards uh, more agents and just not mm. on a text. And then the multimodal is another one. So kind of combining those two, like, you know, it's looking at your desktop. You, 
it's not that you have to ask it. It's just looking at your desktop, what it's doing. <laughs> and it tells you, like, it, mm. it creates a whole other conversation. And instead of asking a question, you give it a task and it comes back with the result of the task. So that's kind of where definitely, you know, research and technology will evolve. And you're right that, you know, the first patterns will stabilize on the application layer, but we will see kind of a reduction of that code with things moving into services. Like, you know, a rag system, you probably, you know, now implement yourself. In half a year's time, you just use one of the SaaS vendors' solutions for this. Mm -hmm. So kind of keeping those uh, on. But what I... I personally look very interested in that um, we now do typically a question and answer or verification or kind of that uh, more chatty like uh, thing, but we're now mainly focused on getting documents in there or knowledge, but I look forward to getting more of the historical things that people do. And, and that's, uh, you can think of this as, you keep memory of your behavior, your personal behavior or your company's behavior, and not just on your documents, but you start using that to get better results. Um, and that will feed into the agents, them having access to you know, all the things you've done. Um, and that brings up um, an interesting point where we used to be capturing a lot of data in our data lake, but these new types of functionality um, of behavior or, you know, typically done in analytics and in your data lake, they need to be accessible more in real time mm. because the systems have to kind of get like instant access or to, to make decisions. So the data team is going to have to find a way to expose this intermediate state of in between the data lake and the real time to get access to that memory and event data. So anyway, that's that's something I, I look forward mm. to as the next step into dealing with a memory of behavior and enhancing then the results that you get back uh, for end users. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, you brought so many interesting points, but you know, the, the foundational piece, right? If we just call it LLMs or Gen AI, yeah. like, Maybe that doesn't change significantly this year. I'm sure it'll have higher quality, yep. more data points, whatever. But the approaches to optimizing around it, right, to to get better and better outcomes, I think that ties into the application. So we'll be building applications or applying this tech and saying, oh, that's not accurate enough. That's not fast enough. And so trying to create better and better techniques, trying to get data more readily available, faster. Uh, so it will be... My, my take from that, which I believe is a rapid rate of change and a rapid rate of exploration to optimize and build the applications that we want to build. It won't just be like, okay, the tech is fine. Now we're just building applications and using yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Each one of those applications is going to say, oh, this would be better if we could achieve this. It would be better if we could achieve this. And it's going to push and push and push that envelope. Um, I guess that brings me back to system design, like keep it flexible because this stuff is going to change quickly and making really big bets on things that are so early feels like it's going to be uh you know, come back to haunt you sort of thing. Yeah. What was it? Like everything can be solved with another layer of abstraction, but we all know how that goes. Right. So, <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. Be careful. I, I know it's such terrible advice, like abstract everything, but don't abstract too much. Like, uh, you know, I, you know, one, one of my favorite, um, oh, I'm not going to be able to reference it at all, but, but a, a notion that I read on someone's blog and people listening would be able to remember what it is, but uh, was this notion of, of building things to be easily deleted, right? Mm -hmm. Like it isn't always that you need to have the perfect abstraction, just make it easy to get rid of it and put something else in place, right? Like mm -hmm. there's lots of ways to think about it. Just be aware that you're making decisions uh, and you're making decisions in a, in a very uh, rapidly evolving space. And that will allow you to think about, okay, how do I, hedge a little yeah. bit how do i cushion myself against what is likely a change i am um, making the cost of change low right or like yeah kind of keeping that in check indeed um i i think another area of interesting research yes you know scrutiny on what goes into an llm and those are like expected things in, in my opinion but dealing with access control mm. that especially with agents 
how do we deal with like an agent getting access on behalf of a user in many companies that that is really going to be hard like how do you describe this because it's not just one user like what action is that but and we already know this is a little bit like whenever we write a slack bot or github actions we're we're, we're a bit uneasy on uh, give it too much pers permissions not enough and that's mm -hmm. that's another pressure point i feel that we're gonna uh be knocked on yeah that's like the um yeah, obviously copyright law has been a big uh, topic in general in terms of training data. But if you if you push training data, you know, internally in an organization that's outside of the bounds of what someone should have access to, you know, are you building different models per person? Like it's it, it, obviously like our back has been a very challenging problem forever. <laughs> Before we introduced, you know, trained training data sets and stuff like that. So uh, I don't know. I, you know, <laughs> that will be a fascinating area. I think that, that this will evolve both publicly in terms of public data sets and what's being pulled into them and who has the rights to that. And then internally, you know, in, in private data sets, again, to your point with agents and access and, um, wow. Well, not that we're here to make predictions, but my prediction is we're going to get a few things very wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and there will be very public cases where that's explained and, and we'll all learn from it. Um, so a word of caution, I guess, to everyone who's thinking about applying this internally. But, you know, again, same terrible advice, like be cautious, but don't be too cautious. Because if you're waiting for it all to get sorted out, you're going to be very far behind where others yeah. are, you know, taking advantage of the, of the technology. Anything uh, else that you're really excited about, you know, coming up this year or like outside of Gen AI, that's just like a trend in the industry that maybe everyone lost sight of. Um, there, there's some signs about the concept of the digital twin. I know it's now been mentioned a few times around config management, but mm -hmm. um the way that I think about it is that we've now made a lot of advancement in unstructured way of dealing with data mm -hmm. this year. But if we can get a better way of also dealing with more complex data and kind of merge them in. I always give, give the example of, you know, when you have a video game, uh, it was really hard to produce something realistically a character. Like it would take a lot of compute. Mm -hmm. And then they would overlay this with a deep fake, right? But the two working together creates like a fascinating mm. person. So mm. it's the same thing. Like if I can have my LLM and my agent figure out how to do my config management, but at the same time, I get better at describing my structured data, how my infrastructure looks, then there is a benefit of bringing them both together. So mm -hmm. kind of that concept. Um, and I know digital twins has been used a lot for your infrastructure, but I also like the fact that you can create a digital twin of your organization where you can also reason on. So your infrastructure, your organization, and kind of bring them together in kind of more scenarios uh, together. Anyway, that's, that's oh, wow. another area. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, I mean, I think my takeaway from that is uh, there's, side effects of the pieces that we're working with in a way that like, yes, we've, you know, we figured out unstructured data because we were trying to do something very specific. But then if you say, where else do I have this unstructured data problem? Like what else could I solve with it? Uh, I think that'll open up some really new, interesting avenues of exploration. Awesome. Well, uh, I mean, this was amazing, Patrick, as I expected, uh, your history, everything that you've done to date, being applied to a space that is changing so quickly, uh, finding the points of you know value that we can carry forward, and the things where we're just going to have to you know make some bets and see how it all all plays out. So thank you so much for joining everyone else who's listening. Thank you for listening. If you want us to talk to anyone or talk about anything, find us on Twitter at Circle CI. If you enjoy the podcast, register. Follow, subscribe, whatever on your podcast provider of choice. And Patrick, again, thank you so much for joining me here today. You're welcome. So you know, my pleasure. Anytime. If you like what you heard today and want to learn more about building, testing, and delivering AI-enabled software, we've gathered all our best resources and tutorials into one place. Go to circleci.com slash AI-ML to explore and start learning.